you wrote um, Eagle in the Snow, which is yes. inspired by an extraordinary true story that, again, not many people know. Well, that's what I love, is the discovery, the discovery of, just for me, it's not, it's not because it's a wonderful thing to do, it's just suddenly you tumble upon these stories. Um, and it's a man called Henry Tandy, um, who... An extraordinary thing happened to him, really. He was um, the most decorated private soldier. That means a soldier with no rank, and, except private. Mm -hmm. So the lowest of the low, field marshal at the top, generals, and all these colonels and brigadiers, and right down the line, the private soldiers. These are the ones who mostly got killed. Anyway, Henry Tandy um, was an extraordinary uh, young man, really, because he was... Um, he was utterly fearless. Um, no one could quite understand. Whenever anything was needed, uh, and someone was lying wounded in no man's land, he simply wouldn't think twice he'd go out and fetch him back in again. And he was wounded again and again and again. But they never killed him. And he just kept doing these things. And he was always the first to charge into um, an attack. And he, he was promoted to corporal, but he didn't want to be. So he said, no thanks, he stayed private. And then right towards the end of the war, when our side, the Allies as they were called, that's the, the British and the French and the Americans and the Canadians and everyone were pushing the Germans back. There was an extraordinary action that took place. Um, as they were going forward, some Germans were fighting very bravely and um, dying in large, large numbers. And uh, Henry Tandy was with his company of soldiers and uh, there was a German machine gun firing at them and so he Dandy did what he always did. He sort of got up and thought, well, I'll sort that lot out. And he threw grenades and he ran forward and he killed many, many Germans and took many of them prisoner. Uh, and there was a lot of noise of the battle, a lot of smoke. Um, but the Germans weren't resisting anymore. And through the smoke, he suddenly saw this German soldier on his own, looking very dazed, walking towards him. And all the other, all his friends, put up their rifles as if they're going to shoot him. And Hans said, no, no, don't. He said, we've done enough, we've done enough. He's not. And he called the guy over and they met face to face. And Dandy told him to drop his rifle down. And uh, they couldn't speak, he couldn't speak any German. So I don't know what language he used, but it was something like, go home, Fritz and he waved him away. But the two men had looked at each other across quite a short distance. And that was the end of it, the war ended, and for that action he won a Victoria Cross, which is the highest decoration mm -hmm. you can get in the British Army. And um, he went to receive the medal from the, the King at Buckingham Palace after the war was over, and then he went back to Coventry where he lived and went back to his factory and led a quiet life. He didn't play the hero, he didn't want any press or publicity, he just wanted to go back to out and get on with his life. Sadly, he couldn't, because many years later, they started, the story came out in the 1930s when Adolf Hitler was Chancellor of Germany. He put it about that his life had been spared by a British Tommy in the First World War. And he knew the name because he'd seen a picture of Tandy receiving his medal. And he'd been shown it clearly by his advisors, who said, I know this man Tandy, um, saved my life. And of course the press came knocking on his door and said, you just saved the life, you saved the life of Adolf Hitler. And no one liked Adolf Hitler already. He, we weren't at war by this time. Um, and then of course later on we were. And the first thing he wanted to do was to join up. Um, again, and he was told he couldn't, he'd been wounded too badly. Um, and so this was the man who, with one bullet, mm. could have stopped the Second World War from happening, because without any question, the Second World War happened because of Adolf Hitler. He was the one who motivated those kind of people in Germany at the time to become Nazis, to do what they did. And if he had pulled his trigger that day, or allowed the others to pull theirs, there would have been no Adolf Hitler. And so I wrote a story around that and I called it An Eagle in the Snow. Mm.
And in your story, he tries to make it right, doesn't he? He, he tries to make it right, but I didn't think I'd do... I think you can do these things called spoilers, can't you? <laughs> you can say too much, and I didn't really know where to stop in the telling of the tale. No, there's a point at which, and I've done this with all my books, really, there's a point at which some of them are absolutely true. I've just written a story, uh, as mm -hmm. it happens, called In the Mouth of the Wolf, which is completely true from beginning to the end. In this case, the man is absolutely true. What he did mm -hmm. uh, is true. But then I take the story a step further, and I tend to do that. I think I grew up as a child loving to tell stories, and the more risky they were to tell, the more I liked telling them. When you tell them out loud, they're called lies. <laughs> and um, I was a good little liar at school. I really was very, very good, mostly to keep myself out of trouble. Um, but I, but I, it's always based on truth, and we all know, mm. actually, when you tell a lie, mm. um, and I'm not advocating that we should uh, say children tell lies. It's not a good idea. Really wrong. <laughs> However, just a little hint for you that if you're going to tell a lie, keep most of it true. Mm. And that way people will believe it. And then once they believe it, you can tell them anything. Mm. You know. <laughs> a recipe for storytelling. I think you better cut that Michael out. There'll be, all sorts of, there'll be all sorts of trouble. The scissors are coming out already. <laughs> Am I right in remembering that Hitler kept the evening standard framed on his no, wall No, no, what Hitler did, he, this is all, all completely true. He, at some stage, um, one of his advisors in England discovered there was a painting of Henry Tandy carrying a oh, wounded soldier it. into a hospital in northern France after that very battle where he'd done this. And it was in the officer's mess up in Yorkshire uh, of a regiment up there called the Green Howards. And he, they sent a military attaché out there, this is when we were at peace, and they said, could we make a copy of this? Because our chancellor would um, like a copy. So they made a copy. And it hung on his wall at his house up in the mountains called the Berkers Garden. And when Neville Chamberlain, in 1938, uh, our prime minister, flew across to try and make a peace with Hitler, Hitler took him by the arm and showed him this picture and said, that's Henry Tandy. He's the man who saved my life. And that's, that's the story. Now, the problem with all these stories is you're not quite sure mm. um, how true it is. Because what, what um, was supposed to have happened is that Chamberlain came back with a message for Henry Tandy and tried to ring him up. That's where I feel the story falls apart a bit, because most people didn't have phones no. in their houses in those days. So in, I think he phoned him at work. factory workers. He phoned him at work. That's what he did. Anyway. You, so you don't know, and that's, I don't mind that. I love, because all history is to some extent, if we don't really know, and we know when the kings are born, the kings die. But for instance, if a king has been killed in a battle, we don't know, we don't know who killed mm. Richard III. You can make a good mm. story up about who did, but we don't know. Um, and what's lovely about Richard III, for instance, is that sometimes you learn more about, centuries later, you know more about what actually happened even more than Shakespeare did, and he wrote a play about him. And I rather love that. Yeah. And we must remember when we're talking about history and inventing stories around um, history, um, which is always on the cusp of legend and, and myth. Um, I mean, I've just come back from Greece, from this island called Ithaca, uh, where a great writer, a man called Homer, told the story really of the fall of Troy and of the journey home of the great Odysseus it took 10 years and he had this adventure and that adventure. Uh, but all the places are there, all the places that he landed, all his friends and the war in Troy and the wooden horse, it's all there. Um, and we know Troy was there and we know it was roughly the right date. So he, he may have been mostly right. The gods played a big part in that too, yeah. which is a, uh, you know, we can always talk about that. But the way you use stories in history is up to the writer fairly decent writer called Shakespeare did this again and again and again in his history plays. Um, and, you know, he, he, he took history and he twisted it. And sometimes to his own purpose, well, that's fine.